All right. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dig in. Lord, we thank you for the, the blessed opportunity to be in your word. And we pray that you would send your spirit, as you promise, to lead us into all truth. And then, Lord, to remind us of what we have been taught, that we may be your faithful witnesses. Grow us in faith and hope and love through this word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, open to Colossians, right? Colossians chapter 1. We're going to dive right in here, and then we'll do some of the where is Colossae and all that stuff as we get into it. Uh, do I have a volunteer? So I need a volunteer for Colossians 1, verse 1. Do we have a volunteer to start with the first verse there? Bill? All right, I need a volunteer for uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 13. Paul? Okay. Okay. Um, then I'm going to need a volunteer for Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Anybody willing to take Acts? So Cheryl, you've got that. All right. And we will pick up from there because there may be some other things along the way. All right. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Please. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. There you go. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Why does why St. Does Paul identify himself as an apostle? And then the related question, okay, so what is what is an apostle? And to that note, let's, let's go ahead and read the Luke passage. I forgot, who had Luke, Paul? Yeah. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. So what is what is an apostle? Follower. Uh, a follower, not just a not just a follower, but something even more specific. But you're onto it. Believer then called. You, yes. Now now we're now we're talking called, right? Called by whom? Jesus. Called by Jesus, right? There were only twelve of these. So an apostle uh, is, and this becomes a little controverted, and we'll get back to this uh, later with Paul because. Paul was not one of the original 12 um, and was called an apostle. But an apostle, an apostle is one who is called by Jesus um, and is a witness of the resurrection. Apostle lit literally means sent one, right? Who are sent from. So um, it's uh, the Greek, if I remember rightly, is apostello. So from and send, okay? So you're, the apostles are sent from whom? From Jesus, right? Jesus, in fact, it refers to himself as sent from the Father. I think John 17, if I remember rightly. Um, so an, an apostle is one sent with the authority of the sender. Now, we see this all over through the Gospels. This is, but this is uh, this is a big deal with Paul. Paul, you see, frequently defends his apostleship because it's it's frequently under attack. He is sent by Jesus with the authority of Jesus. I didn't um, I didn't quote the verse here, but it's Second Peter. Um, I'm trying to I think this the reference where where Peter refers to the writings of Paul as scripture. Um, if somebody can find that reference, and forgive me, it's going right over my head right now. Um, Paul and the other writings, right? Um, so Peter, Peter, in, in that in that verse, acknowledges that Paul's writing is authoritative. So Paul is an apostle, one sent with the authority of Jesus, right? This is and this is a big deal. So apostle is an eyewitness of the resurrection. Um, and of course, you know, Paul is called, you know, the story to Damascus road experience, and then his call to the apostle to the Gentiles and so forth. In that first verse of it, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, <coughs> our brother, right? Timothy, um, who has Acts chapter 16, verse 1? Cheryl, you have that? Yeah. 
Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Okay. You, you may recall Lystra from the first missionary journey, or you may recall it from walking along the east wall of St. Paul's. There's a back window there of Paul at Lystra. The, so the first missionary journey, in fact, if you turn in your study guide, um, <coughs> let's see, because my pagination is different because I have some additional. So page three of your study guide, it has, uh, these are the missionary journeys of St. Paul. So that if the solid line in your study guide is the, and so for those of you watching on video, you just have to download the study guide and look. Um, but the, the Sava line is the first missionary journey. They start in Syrian Antioch, that's on the east side. Then they go to the island of Cyprus, and then up, and you can see Perga, right? That's where, whether we know for sure or not, but that's where tradition has it, that Paul got malaria. There was, in the ancient world, um, reputed to be a particularly virulent strain of malaria, which may have been, because if you know anybody with malaria, it comes back and is searing one of my African friends who suffered from malaria said when he got an attack, it was like having a hot iron staked through his head. Um, it, it, there is some tradition that the thorn in the flesh about which um, Paul speaks could have been the malaria thing. Um, regardless, so you see north then to what is called Pisidian Antioch, and then east to Iconium, Lystra, and then Derby. Right? Lystra is where um, the Paul and Barnabas did a great miracle, and then um, he gave credit to God, and the, the Jews kept stirring things up, and Paul was believed to be stoned to death. Right? But they prayed for him, and he, he rose. That's that's Lister. So along that, this is this is likely where the conversion of Paul's mother and grandmother takes place. Yes. Second Peter three fifteen. That sounds right. Second, go ahead, read it. Second Peter, hold it. Second Peter. 3, 15, 16. And count the patience of our Lord and salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks to them and of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. It's a pretty significant statement. Sorry, Paul attesting that the that the there's Peter attesting that the writings of Paul are 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 sacred scripture, right? So this is that's a big deal. So Timothy, uh, the encounter at Lystra, his family, um, I believe it's the when he comes back the second missionary journey that he picks Timothy up and starts uh, taking Timothy along with him. Timothy's the one that has uh, a Gentile father and a Jewish mother, and so forth. So um, you'll see him. The other thing I want to talk about there that's question C, uh, question 1C, it says, uh, it's in verse 1, it, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and what? And Timothy, our brother. Why would St. Paul say that? And Timothy, our brother. Why do you think St. Paul would say that? He's emphasizing that they're of the same mind. Not just of the same mind, but you're onto it. They're all of one family. That, right, this, this, we, we don't want to, I mean, I think we kind of assume this, we know this. This is an enormous deal. We read the New Testament, and this is a big deal in Colossians. It's an enormous deal in Romans and in Galatians, right? You, people wanting to divide themselves at, at the a, a great thrust of the, of the teaching of the Lord that comes through St. Paul is of the essential unity of the church. Right? Uh, you see this, I think the greatest p picture of this is in Revelation, right? where, where you have all these people of every tribe and tongue and people and nation gathering around the, around the throne and, 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 singing, and singing to the Lord. 
there, there is an essential unity, right, in a, in a world that had very sharp class divisions. Now, Timothy, our brother. I think, you know, I want to, I didn't take off the top of this on purpose, especially this stuff. <laughs> How is there a parallel here? So Paul's addressing uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, which emphasizes the essential unity in the faith, regardless of whatever divisions there were in the Roman world. How is that also applicable to us? How is that also applicable to us? Not just are to be, but in fact we are. Um, and yet, there is a lot of work going on in this country trying to divide, right? And, you know, you study First Corinthians for you know, sometimes some divisions, distinctions are necessary, but Paul continues to remind, right? There, there are forces, and there are forces at work in Colossae as they were in Corinth, as they were in Ephesus, and, and all over the place, trying to divide and separate. And so much of the work of St. Paul is to re remind God's people of the essential unity that we have in Christ, right? And not to foster unnecessary divisions. I think this right at the get-go is enormously important. There, there, are, there are undoubtedly some Jews. We know there are Jews at the congregation in Colossae. There are also some former pagans, right? And these weren't, right? This provides us some interesting opportunity as we go through the letter. Um, because the pagan world, um, they were a very religious people. I mean, you know, I mean, our people tend to be secular. We say we're not religious in the United States, but we are. Even though we are, right? there was all kinds of religious practice and religious practice that, that Jews would consider utterly abhorrent. All kinds of idolatry and sexual practice and asceticism, uh, all kinds of different stuff. Um, and yet God was bringing these together. Yes? Um, at this period of time, do you think he said that because John and Peter had this dispute about you, whether or not you had to be a Jew? Be a follower. Right. Without a doubt, this is part of it. Right. Timothy, who was a Gentile, Gentile father, Jewish mother, um, and his own status among amongst the helpers was was under dispute in some places. Um, but that is that is absolutely part of it. You know, maybe at the at the center of it, but it's there's a bigger people want to divide. They want to have they they want to have a class church. Um, you know, with striations, gradations of you know who, who's who and who's what. Um, this this is should be anathema in the life of the church. And we spent a lot of time already just on verse one, but you can see you can see how you can see how important uh, this is. This will be a big deal also as we go forward. All right, let's go to verse two. Now we're really moving. <laughs> All right. Somebody read Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 2. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Colossae. Yeah. Oh, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Yeah, you got it. Oh, yeah, and that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that. All right? So um, what's your translation? You have an IV there, right, Jill? Okay. Some of you have a slightly different translation, and let's, what does that say? To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Nicolau. To the saints and faithful brethren. Okay. What's, what's the significance, so question, question uh, 2A, what's the significance of Paul addressing the Colossians as saints and faithful brothers and Jill's NIV translation gives us a little bit of help here, actually. They're faithful to Christ. Yeah, or that, yeah, well, and that's all, yeah, that's in kind of a secondary thing. The, the word for, for saints is hagioi, 
which can also be translated as holy ones. Holy in and of themselves or declared holy. Declared holy. This is so when we are um, the, really, this is related to sacred or sanctified, right? If you are if you are sanctified, you are declared holy. You're, it, it's it's a it's a word it's a word used of of God claiming something to be set apart for sacred purpose. This so this this address right, to to the Colossians here. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints, to the holy ones, to the ones who have been called by God. Right? Not just saints, but also to the saints, to the holy ones, and the... And what else? Faithful brothers. Now, this also, this is in a sense, reiterating something we've talked about earlier. <clears throat> so we're in Colossians 1, verse 2 here. Okay. What does this imply? Faithful brothers. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers at Colossae. It's more of a call to unity, or again, right? We're coming again. back, coming back to this, but he's he's also saying, right? He, he's also he's also he's he's reminding them as we'll go of a work which God had done among them, right? Because none of us are faithful by nature, right? We we it, that is a is a gift, but there's also this. I mean, Timothy is a brother, but now the people at Colossae are also brothers, right? Um, this is it. This is an enormous deal because Paul's Paul's going to, as we're going to discover, Paul's writing this letter because there is a pernicious heresy at work in in Colossae, the ancient city. We'll talk more about that. Yes. What's the difference between the saints and the faithful? A little bit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good. What's the difference between saints, saints and faithful? So if you're, it's two different sides of a similar coin, right? Uh, this, it's there are also uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrews. If you read the if you read the Psalms in particular, um, Hebrew and Eastern people, but Hebrew in particular has you, you often say the same thing in slightly different ways. Um, to, to, emphasize, to emphasize things. So there are they are saints, they are called by God, separate, called by God, set apart for sacred purpose, and and a family of faith. Could it not also be yeah. looked at as, as uh, now it's escaping one of those senior things where it's breathing down and taking it away. Uh, the, the difference is between actions speak louder than words. So the faithful ones are actively in the faith. And we're going to come to that in a minute, because that's, that's in an upcoming verse, for sure. Yes, yeah, sure. Aren't we all called to be saints? Ding! <laughs> Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So right, th this is, this is part. when you are baptized, it's so sure I'll ask, you know, in kind of the, aren't we all saints? You know? Um, yes! Right? You, 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 don't, you don't have to do 50 miracles and be edified by the Roman Catholic Church to be a saint. Um, you know, and yes, I'm picking on my Roman Catholic cousins here. Um, I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> because because when, when you are baptized, Pastor Shockman makes, makes reference to this in his sermon today, when you are baptized, you, you are buried and raised with Christ. Christ is a reasonably significant person in the whole life of things, right? I mean, I mean, right? He's the right, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, right? Who spoke all things into existence, who died and rose again. And I think a lot of us, this is what and why we emphasize it and re-emphasize it all the time, because it gets kind of we it just goes over our heads, or we we, we struggle. It just 
to recognize, to accept, to believe what in fact Cheryl just reminded us of. There is no division, right? No. And that we are, we are all in our in your baptism is a sanctif is a justifying ceremony where whereby you are justified, declared right before God, but it's also a sanctifying ceremony. You are set apart for sacred purpose. You are you become a holy thing, as it were. And but yeah. You know, I think we can struggle with the word holy because in one sense that means without sin, right? Not necessarily. But it could. Yeah. Yeah, I mean this is this is also good. We'll come back to this also in flash <laughs> right. In Christ, um, in Christ we're covered with, with his righteousness. Right? Mm -hmm. and so in Christ is sin. Um, I, w I was thinking about this because the, the, if you haven't been in worship yet, the, the text um, is related to marriage and divorce. And Pastor Shockman, I think, does a great job of getting what the real core issue is there today. But I, I found myself thinking, being reminded of when I was, you know, where's Siobhan, right? When I was in premarital counseling uh, 26 years ago, and my pastor reminding me. I, you know, I have my own history of which I'm not very proud. And my, my pastor reminding me, Lance, when Christ forgives you, you are holy and clean. Um, you know, reminding, reminding us, remember this, Gary? Were you, were you, or was that just me that was part of that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> side thing leading up to it with Pastor Meyer or something, but you know, Lance, when you stand before God, you're going to see this beautiful woman standing before God in white, right? That white represents that, that she is unblemished in Christ's in Christ size, just as Lance, you are, he told me. So you stand there radiant and glorious, um, which I think is glorious and wonderful to hear, because you know, we all know that the deeper truth about ourselves, but we are in Christ covered with with His completeness and glory. Yes. I'm just thinking it came into my mind almost immediately. Aren't we also called the Brotherhood of Believers? Yes. There's a, there, yes, and by the way, you think the third article of the Apostles' Creed says we believe, believe in the Holy Spirit, the the Holy Christian Church, the <laughs> communion of saints, right? Right. The, so this. Um, the body of Christ. So yeah, there is a there is a, a, a communion of, say, of of God's called people called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Yes. Um, just with what Cheryl was talking about, the holiness and the sin. We so consciously focus on how we see ourselves, but it's really how God sees us. I, I look at I think God gives us marriage and family as just a little glimpse of what His love is for us. And I think of my kids. When I see my kids. Absolutely right. By the way, we are only halfway through now, verse two. <laughs> uh, isn't right? But there, there's, there, there's a. There, we will go. God, so help us, God, much faster as we go along here. So you know, David, because uh, next week um, our family's coming to worship at five, but Siobhan's wedding is Sunday at three, so we're not going to be here Sunday morning. So David, David's got the, the morning thing. Um, my suspicion is, at this point, David, that you're just going to finish this lesson. We're not even going to get to the next one. And if you've seen how things go with Journeyman when I laid it, we don't move much faster. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I hope to move a little bit more quickly. But this, right, the Paul's, Paul's entrance, um, the beginning here is, is important for them, and it's important. 
uh, for us. So let's talk uh, question 2B. Likewise, in his address, Apostle, the Apostle Paul blesses the and I notice the question, Apostle Paul blesses the Colossians with grace and peace. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, then grace and peace. Let me, let me read something uh, that I picked up from my, this is from uh, our Concordia commentary. As in all the apostles' letters, Colossians begins with Paul's customary adaptation of the salutation of a typical contemporary Greek letter. Such letters usually began with, so Paul, Paul's letter to the Colossians follows a standard form. You know, when we begin a letter today, that letter usually begins with, Dear. Dear. you know, Hello, hi. <laughs> Dear Bob, okay? You know, and then, and, then, and then there's the address, whatever is said, and then at the end, you, you say who it's from. In, in, the, ancient, in the ancient world, you, you, ha you have, and let me, let, me, let me get this right, you have writer's name, you have the writer's name, and then the addressee, all right, then you have the addressee, um, followed by the greeting. The Apostle Paul adapts the typical ancient with uh, greeting with this. Um, he changes the greeting, so the, the word greeting in Greek is um, kairin. Paul slips in a different word, uh, charis, which is grace. So rather than say greeting, he says grace. And now and then there's, then he brings in the kind of the Hebrew side of it, peace. So what's the significance what 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 tone so grace? What do we what is what is grace? Undeserved love. Undeserved love. Good answer, Lutheran girl. <laughs> okay, grace is under undeserved love. And the peace here is borrowed. What's the and, and peace is borrowed from what Hebrew word? What's underneath it? Shalom, which is a um, a rest of body and soul, health of body and soul. So, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace. Right? And so this is not a let right this this is an apostolic blessing. Right? He is so remember this this letter is going to be right this ancient world, we don't have copy machines, there he's not sending it out by email or on a blog or some other such thing. This letter would be what? It would be read out loud. So whoever the the, pa the pastor is as it's received we'll see it's probably not the founding pastor, but maybe, um, stands before the congregation and reads it. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints at, and holy brothers at Colossae, grace, right? Paul is blessing them, grace, and peace to you, right? Um, so now, let's look at number three. And I apologize, uh, it might be a little small for you. I tried to find a decent map of Colossae. There are all kinds of different things. But if you look on the, on the left side, and this is on the left side of your map, you, you might see Ephesus. The print is going to be small. Did, he, did you find Ephesus there? OK. 
right? And then you see 100, 120 miles to the east, there's Colossae, right? Um, you might see just to the west of Colossae is Laodicea. That should sound familiar from a letter to a church that we find in the book of in, in Revelation. They're also to the north and west, you see Smyrna, Sardis, Philadelphia, Pergamum, Thyatira. Does those sound familiar? That's all Revelation, right? Yeah. Are you, is your mind kind of blown right now? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, those are real places. Yeah. What's the one right above Laodicea that doesn't seem to get any references? Hierapolis. Yeah, nothing ever happens there? Uh, <laughs> or what's saying? Right, what it's like Juno. I don't you know. Um, I don't know. Um, you have to want to go there. Yeah. Um, now, I'm, I'm trying to, it does come up, it does come up somewhere else, and I just can't. Um, so, Colossae, yes, Russ. Do we have any idea what the size of the congregation at Colossae was? And, um, and after yeah. Paul goes on his journeys to these various cities, was it Timothy, did Timothy stay behind him? Was he kind of like the, one of the leaders of that congregation, keeping it going and bringing followers to Christ? I don't remember, uh, honestly, Russ, whether it was whether Timothy stayed here or not. Um, there are other places where Timothy was. I don't remember. I, I, in, we might get to that next week or the week after. But I, I frankly don't know the answer to your question. Sometimes that happens. Um, but yeah, whether Timothy stayed, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. don't know. Um, was there another question there that I was missing? <laughs> oh, size of the congregation. Um, we do know this is part of the reason I put it in there. Colossae is a formerly great city, but um, it's it's a city very much in decline at, at this time. So four centuries earlier, uh, there was a major trade route, that, but they moved they moved the north south road. If I, as I read in my research, from so there was Colossae was kind of a, an intersection a little farther back in the ancient world, but they, they moved the trade route to the west a little bit, and and that led to their decline. And then, if, if I remember rightly, there was a major earthquake in, I think, AD 60. It might have been right after this letter was received that reduced uh, Colossae to rubble. And to my knowledge, uh, it is still largely nothing to this day. Um, so. But in, in in the ancient world, it was it was known for uh, trade goods, textiles. The wool from Colossae was especially valued um, in some dyed purple and so forth. Yeah, so it was the the wool from Colossae, if I remember, was supposed to be very soft. So it was it was a city. Uh, it was a city in decline. You know, I mean, you could probably think of any number of cities that were once great. You know, even here in Wisconsin, perhaps. You know, what's that? Detroit, yeah, thank you for my my home state, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for my friends from Detroit who might be watching, but yeah, that's pretty much true. All right. All right. Um, so you so you have a you have a and this provides some help for us as we go forward. It's a formerly great city, but in decline. Um, a, a city, uh, there is obviously a Jewish population. Uh, here, because there, there's there's some missionary work that occurs there, but it's also, as we'll see, a lot of you know, it is. These were all just religion, religious people. I mean, we. This is one of the ways where we have to take off our American lenses because we are, for the most part, a, re, a, a very secular people. You know, we're we're accustomed to people just not going to church or not doing really any kind of religious practice. That was not the case. Everybody was religious, even if even if the religion was sex cult or moon god or worshiping this idol or, or that. I mean, they, they were they were all very religious. Recall uh, Paul in Athens in Acts chapter 17. I you know see all these statues everywhere. I see Paul says to the to the people, I see that you are 
of very religious people. That, that kind of statement could have applied in pretty much anywhere in the ancient world. Um, we also are a very religious people. We are a very religious people. We just don't call it that. Um, let's, let's pause there. I have, I have a very distinct idea about the answer to this question, but I'm curious what yours are. What is the great religion? What is, what is the God Self. of our age? Self. All right, pastor's kid. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I just think we are, we are an incredibly religious people. Um, and our religion is, at our, uh, we are our own, right, this is, we, we, choice, right, we get to do, we believe that we are radically autonomous individuals. We are, we are our own gods. Are we, are, our, yes, did I see a hand, Heidi? Oh, I said self. Yeah, self. Yeah, right, so, yeah, I mean, every, it, it's, no, my personal happiness, whatever I might want for myself, supersedes whatever else anybody might say. There's no, I, there's no authority outside ourselves that really has final authority over us in our culture. We get to decide. So why, why when you visit a college, when you visit a college now, Right, you get to choose whatever pronouns you are. Right. Yeah. Yes. It goes further than that. Yes. Yeah. It's not only that, that but it, you have to feel the same way about you have to accept. You yeah. have to agree. You know, it's no longer, well, this is how I am. And yeah. I'm okay with that. But now it's everybody else has to, has to agree with me. Right. And has to say that, yes, you know, it's recognized. So it's, I mean, it's, it, it, would, it would be like saying that every world will. Yes, and regardless of what that might mean. Yeah. yeah. So, it, what, which leads to, quite frankly, leads to chaos. And that's, in some respects, what we have. Um, I'm going to pick a bone here with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. I just listened to a speech at Hillsdale that he made the other day. Um, it's a good speech, by the way. He just, he just did an address at Hillsdale College. Um, you guys are familiar with what that is. Um, and Secretary Pompeo, you know, he's, it, it's, a, it's a political speech, but um, and by the way, I, you know, I knew he was a smart guy, but Mike, Mike Pompeo was um, first in his class at West Point. And he was a dummy. And then he was first in his class at Harvard Law School. Yeah. You know, holy cow. Yeah, that's some serious intellectual firepower. Um, but, you know, he, he's, you know, he's positing, you know, America is, a, is about um, the individual. Versus, and he's opposing that to all this stuff that's going on on the left. It's all about the collective. I don't think he's totally right about that. Uh, if you, well, you'd have to go look at. Right? I mean, Pompeo was saying that you know that if the United States, America, was about exalting the individual, and it's not about the it's not about the collective. And I think he's overstating the point. One of the early right, the early French sociologists is Alexis de Tocqueville that goes around. You know, it's the genius, the genius of America is, is that was the um, the recognition of individual rights, but the but the and I, I'm forgetting uh, De Tocqueville's phrase, but but that the people gathered together to work together to make things happen. I think the genius of America is not an either or there; it's actually the both and. And I don't think I don't think the pushing of the either or thing helps our civic life. Um, I mean, I, it's done. For, it's one of the things that's done for politics. I just don't. Th I, don't I don't think if if we if we. If, I think Pompeo's making the make, make, actually aiding and abetting the, by make, by that state aiding and abetting this kind of garbage. And I say that with respect to him. Um, but if we are fundamentally radically autonomous individuals, well, then you you know, then you can 
be a liberal or a conservative, but you're still radically autonomous and it ends up with some chaos. Yes? Can we not uh, um, look at this and focus on the fact that we're all created with special gifts? Yep. None of us are, uh, are uh, God doesn't make bad things. And if you look for strength in individuals, and you want them to be of one mind, the ultimate is what is their motive for how they're functioning? And you come right back to what selfishness is. And when God says you love one another, you are looking outward and care, not inward. Yep. So here you go with the 11th this commandment, as I call it, that Jesus gave on Thursday uh, before he was crucified. You cannot do anything greater than this by new command, that you love one another as I love you. Great. Well, how can you do that love if your selfishness has you always looking inward yep. and you are... And you um, can be an utterly selfish conservative and you can be an utterly selfish liberal. And it's the devil's favorite tool, divide and conquer because you are told to concentrate on that, which doesn't bring you together, but it tears you apart. So, let's, let's, go, let's go back to Colossians. Um, so somebody read verse three. Rocking on to verse three, we have a volunteer. <laughs> We always thank God the Father. Somebody other than Bill, please. And I'm not picking on you, but it needs, we need, I want to involve other people. So somebody else got verse 3? Rachel. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. A great verse. So, right, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. What does Paul, what does Paul affirm there? We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does Paul affirm there? That whenever he is writing to them or speaking to them, it's from God? Yes. And also, just the relationship, because this is going to be a big deal later, between the Father and the Son. The eternal, I mean, we, you know, we again, we kind of assume, but this is part of this is going to be in the in the next big section that is our theme verse, right? Christ is in all, Christ is preeminent. Christ is the eternal Son of the Father. One of the one of the great heresies that we, the ancient, they faced in the ancient world that we face too is that Christ is not, you know, he may be important, but he's not fully God in the way that the Father is God. Um, that leads to all kinds of it, it leads to all kinds of craziness. So. Paul, Paul is affirming, among other things, um, the the relationship between father and son. And then, what? What? So when he says, um, "Thanks be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ," when we pray for you. So what does "when we pray for you" indicate? I would say a couple different things. That when when we pray for you. I think it means that. They're on their mind a yep. lot. And the they here in particular will be? Think, well, call it that. well, no, the, the they, the they, oh, the, they, so they are praying for the they, who are, who's the letter addressed from? Paul oh, and Timothy. Timothy. But by implication, as we'll see elsewhere, there are others with them. So the, the church, right? We, right? So part of that apostolic ministry is they were regularly in prayer for their for their missions wherever and, and Paul hadn't established as we'll find out Paul hadn't established the mission in Colossae others had so it so it indicates a churchliness and um, and as we're going to find out very quickly here a pastoral concern for the Colossians all right let's do verse four it's interesting yeah that yeah Nuance is a good word. There is a lot there. Um, well, it's making me think, Michelle, when you are writing a letter, 
letter or an email to someone and you have something really important to say, you do weigh every single word because you know the way it's going to be read might be interpreted differently than the way it's Right. Yeah, we, and I think my, that's a good point. Um, Jill was saying that when we write somebody, we, we tend to weigh what we say. My sense is that's less the case now than it was 20 years ago because we do so much writing and so much of it is just kind of, you know, quick out communication by email and text, yeah. I just think it's kind of interesting, you know, the idea of thinking though, you know, and, and thinking about an established church, you know, the, the church leadership writing a mission outpost and thanking them, being thankful for them. Yep. You know, because I think when we think about our mission outpost, you know, we are, we are blessing you with Oh, yeah, our, we think more paternally. Yeah, our yeah. presence and so on and so forth instead of like, wow, we are so thankful for you. Right. I think for me personally, you know, if you read these letters, you know, you read the scripture, you read the letters, you just, you just kind of, me anyway, you just kind of skip over those verses. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're writing so and so on. Yeah. You know, but now it's like, wow, there's way more to it. There's a that. pile, <laughs> there's, right? there's a pile of, there's a pile of stuff there. Yes, Bobby. Was there any persecution going on during this time? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, in terms of, I, I have to suspect yes, but there's also a deep division. So um, as we'll get to, because there is a there is a Colossian heresy uh, that we'll talk about um, that is an incipient, what came to later be called Gnosticism, some of the things. Um, so there is, there is division in the congregation. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, but again, we don't have modern technology. Paul, all indications are that Paul writes this epistle in his Roman imprisonment, and that the man who brought the issue was likely the missionary founder of the mission in Colossae, Epaphras, and if he went by foot, it was a thousand miles. Rome. I mean, we don't we don't know for sure. Did he take some boat? But if he went, but if he went by foot, I mean, he would have he would have had to take a boat, likely, likely in some way, shape, or form. But I didn't. Um, I, one of my books might be able to tell me. But a, a journey of a thousand miles by foot, over mountains and hills and across rivers and all that stuff, is going to be a really extended trip. That did. That gives us an idea, you know, Epaphras, if, if indeed, you know, whether, quite frankly, whether by boat or by foot, was so concerned about what, what's going on in Colossae that he went to see Rome. He went, he went to see Paul in Rome to take the issue to him and say, what, you know, what do we do here? And from that, Paul writes this letter. That, and that gives, an, it gives us, it does that, that puts some context on it, doesn't it? That how, how important this is. And somebody, somebody traveled maybe a thousand miles by foot to bring this Colossian heresy, the issue, to Paul so that he might address it. Um, that's a big deal. Tell you what, that's a good place. David? You get to do. You get to lead the rest of this next week, <laughs> while I am scurrying around and getting ready for a wedding. Um, all right. I think I, I, I think you're going to really enjoy our time in Colossians. Uh, you've already seen a little bit of a glimpse today of. I think there are some real contemporary applications for us. Um, I think it's going to get more deeper and dare I say even more personal as we as we go along. Um, I think I think you really enjoy it. My, so my intention right now, schedule-wise, is I think to do this um, through the middle of December. So and then we'll take a, you know, and then we'll start something else after the year. That's that's my intention. All right. So let's pray. Lord, you give us your grace and peace in Christ. You have given us undeserved love. And a, and a wholeness of body and soul, uh, yes, that we do not deserve. And help us, grant us the faith, Lord, to receive that truth. 
then we might not shy away from it. That, that you cover our guilt, you cover our shame, and help help us then uh, to be light in our families, to be light in our community, light in our state, and in our nation. Help us to be faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.